Hello everybody, welcome back to video, and today I'm going to be reviewing Scream 6. It is this year's Scream movie, and it still holds up, even almost a year later, and it is very incredible. So let's get into this. So the whole concept for the opening, which is, I think, the best place to start, is you get your typical opening, a actress, uh, Samara Weaving in this case, uh, gets a call, and you actually hear not Roger L. Jackson's voice. You instead hear Tony Revolori's voice over the phone. And the whole time you think that they're going on a date, until you find out uh, she's actually being stalked by Ghostface. And then you get, you get you know, her getting killed, and Ghostface saying, line, I, now I see something red, as he does the final knife slash. And then you linger on the frame, and then he takes off the mask, and you see it's Tony Ravalori's character, Jason Carvey. And I just want to say that that's a genius twist. It keeps up the twist angle that Radio Silence started with Scream 5 with having the subject of their opening survive. This time we have a ghost face as the subject of the opening, and it is incredible. It makes us stand out from every other opening and rivals the opening of the original, in my opinion, for the best opening of any Scream movie. Because while that original one is shocking, this one, you think there's a formula, it gets subverted in five, then you think it's gone back to basics with this one, and then a new twist is added. So I absolutely love the opening of this movie. And it also features a very creepy uh, line delivery by Tony Revolori as well. So the opening is definitely one of my favorites, but how does that stack up with the rest of the movie? Well, um, actually, the rest of the movie is very good as well. It's dealing with the aftermath of the previous movie directly. I mean, this one is a big uh, mirror of Scream 2, You've got the college setting and uh, the ghost face motive. We'll get to that one later. So, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here that parallels, too, in a lot of sense. You know, you've got your main character dealing with a, you know, the question of should she trust her love interest? Because Scream 2, it was Sydney and Derek. This time, it's Sam and Danny. So, you know, is it a repeat of the previous movie where the love interest was the killer, or are they actually completely innocent? So, there's a lot of stuff here. So, let's just start with Melissa Barrera. She, I thought she was good in Five, but she's a lot better in this movie than she was in the previous one. And... It's kind of creepy seeing her actually in the ghost face costume at the end of the movie. Because even though she isn't the ghost face of the movie, she does actually put on the costume at the end. Um, which, quick question, does anyone know why the Billy Loomis costume is the only one in a glass case? This is something I only thought about this viewing of the movie, is why is Billy's the only one in a glass case at the Ghostface Museum, right? Because you've got all of the other ones, but only Billy's is in a glass case. That just is, that's just weird to me. Anyway, um, a another thing is Jenna Ortega gets a lot more to do in this movie and surprising turn of events where uh, she and Chad become the new, I guess, romantic relationship of the series, which they needed to do after they killed the best character in the previous one. And I actually was a little shocked by this on first on my first viewing, but I'm fine with this. I actually think that that they actually work well together. Mindy is slightly less annoying in this one because she's not as suspicious. You know, last one, almost every line she said made it seem like she was Ghostface. This time, 
her annoyingness is brought down a little bit, but she's still my least favorite of the, the core four as they're dubbed in this movie. So, yeah. Um, another thing is her monologue of the rules. While I love this movie, unfortunately, I think that after three, they kind of aren't that great with the rules. Maybe that's just because it's not Randy delivering them, because he just delivered them in such an interesting way. But, I mean, I mean, even one of the rules that gets explained here, which is legacy characters are cannon fodder. You know, just their to add to the body count. Spoilers doesn't apply in this one. Because every single character that returned from previous movies makes it through this one. Which I feel like actually means that even though this is a better movie than last year's, I think that last year's, unfortunately, the killers kind of were right that that one had higher stakes because a character from the past did die. And you know what? They give two characters really good would have been death scenes. Um, so we're going to start with the one that isn't as good. Mindy's attack is absolutely filled with suspense because she gets separated from the main characters. And it's a good sequence. It really is. And then she survives. Um, and this is where a spoiler plot hole comes into effect. Why does Ethan, one of this movie's ghost faces, pull her out of the subway car? My personal theory on this one is actually really simple which is the ghost face that actually commits the attack couldn't start on time. And so the attack isn't as lethal as was intended. And so in order to make it himself seem innocent, he pulled Mindy out of the car and got help. I don't know. I just, I think that's the most reasonable way to sum it up. The other one, the standout scene of in my opinion, not just this movie, but of all six, is the Gale attack. It is the best scene in the entire series, and while it would have been sad to see Gale die here, it would have also been the best death scene of the series if she had died. And honestly, I think she only survives because Sydney didn't come back. The phone call is absolutely incredible and worth waiting through six movies to see, and this ghost face just taunts Gale so much. Particularly, I think one of the best line deliveries Roger L. Jackson gives his ghost face is when he's saying, you would have been a good killer. You know, Sydney never made sense and Dewey was the fan favorite. You know, that's, I think, one of the best line deliveries Roger L. Jackson, the ghost, the voice of Ghostface, has in all six movies. It, and he's just really good for the voice acting of this one as well. So, you know, that attack scene, incredible. Only only thing is, it would have been a great send-off to Gale. But, you know what? She is my favorite surviving character that isn't up for debate. So, you know what? I'm fine with that. So, you know, I say up for debate because I personally think that Stu is still alive. By the way, quick thing. A few days before this movie got released... The credit song, Still Alive, got released, and I thought that was in regards to Stu. You know, I just thought that was what it was. Anyway, let's talk about Ghostface in this movie. So, I did not get the identity right. Yes, again, I thought it would be either Stu or Tara. But I made a third guess that there would be three. And so, I'm... I'm giving myself, you know, points for that because I was right. Because Ghostface in this movie, the main Ghostface, is three people. Obviously, Ethan, who I brought up earlier, his actions do not make sense. Pulling Mindy out of the subway car. Uh, also, Wayne Bailey, the detective. And Quinn Bailey, who is allegedly killed, using air quotes there, at the apartment attack earlier in the movie. And you know what? 
Their motive is simple, but it's effective because it's all three of them working together. You know, a bunch of the other movies, they've had separate motives. So one thing I really like about Radio Silence, the Scream movies, is the fact that the ghost faces have a common goal. and They want to see it executed together, which makes it more interesting and because they're all on board with it. So, the twist for this one is the Ghostface Trio is Richie's family. So, it does mirror Mrs. Loomis in Scream 2, but I, I think this is done much better. One, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Laurie Metcalf's performance as Mrs. Loomis and just other issues. You know, that character didn't have a lot to do in Scream 2. This one, there's hints, but you don't really think about it. And... I just love the fact there's three of them. It makes it feel bigger. If I could say anything about that twist, it's I I think that you could get a, you could have gotten away with explaining it to be the family member of one of the victims. People wouldn't have criticized it so much for being so similar to two, but I like this twist because it also perfectly explains the ghost face museum which is one of my favorite sets of the entire series. It, it's an awesome tribute to the series' history. But anyway, um, so, yeah, ultimately, they're out for vengeance, they're out for blood, and I kind of got the impression that they were going to let this one sit, they were going to let the death of Richie sit until they saw how extreme Sam was when it came to killing him. Because, I mean, ultimately, yeah, that was probably one of the most brutal kills of the entire series. Even some that were committed by, you know, actually Ghostface. Um, so, yeah. Also, there's been some people suggesting that the last name of Bailey is actually an alias, I have a different theory that would explain why the mom isn't involved in this one. The script would, was actually going to say that uh, Ethan had killed her. They cut that out, meaning they probably had some other reason. So here's my personal, here's what I personally think is the case. I think that after Richie's mom saw what Bailey, what Wayne Bailey was doing, uh, she decided that she was going to get a divorce and take custody of Richie. Hence, the mom has the last name of Kirsch, and that's Richie's last name. And then you have Detective Bailey and the two kids that he won in the custody battle. There's no evidence of this in the movie, but I think it's the neatest explanation for how they have different last names, but yet are still blood kin. I, I think that's the easiest explanation. So, ultimately... All of the killers are defeated, and everyone lives. So honestly, big thing with this movie is one returning character should not have made it out alive. And honestly, you had two opportunities to give a really cool death scene. And I feel like one of those should have been taken. I feel like Gales was the most obvious one. But again, I feel like that's because Sydney wasn't involved. They had to rewrite it to just include some extra lines saying, oh yeah, she survived her attack. But still, this is my favorite movie of the series. It's very good. The, the action is intense. And there's several great scenes that would normally be some of the best of the series. The bodega attack, the apartment attack. That when it just comes to this movie, they're not highlights. They're great scenes, but they're in a movie with even better scenes. So, I mean, this one, I'm going to give this one a 9.5 out of 10. It's very good. Only thing is, I do feel like one of those near deaths should have actually been a death. But, who knows? We'll see what happens with Seven. That one's in a new creative hand with a different director. So we'll see what happens with this cast of characters.
But that's it for this video. Like and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.